So we had uh, started the great debate, right, which I will not put you into uh, to debate that. And that's why, if you will notice, when it came to Jacob, Arminius, and Calvin, I asked questions. You know why I asked questions? I didn't want to, to disturb you by giving you my opinion. Read for yourself. Praise God. You, God, do your what? From today, start to read about, you know, John, Calvin, what is, who knows the popular word called tulip? Eh? That's uh, Calvinistic. It, that summarizes the whole uh, teaching. Uh, each word represents something. The sovereignty of God, the unconditional, all that, unlimited atonement, you know. Yes, total depravity and then uh, the irresistible grace and things like that. So the reason why I was asking those questions is one for you to note that these later on from the Great Awakening to 2019 will be the standard of the division in the Grace Message Movement. Because some of you think that the Grace Message Movement is united. It is not. It is divided by these things. And um, you don't, as a student, I advise don't study to divide yourself. Study to understand. And when you will do, like I discovered, you'll realize that they, in the truth there, the middle is somewhere in the truth. The truth story is somewhere in the middle. You will see that there are things, if you're a stable minister, you will see that there are things you'll agree of Jacobus, and there are some you'll agree of Calvin. You will see some things there. They will, um, they will open your eyes. Your, your eyes will open. But for every student here, at least do the research for yourself. Do the research for yourself. And, and read, just read. It's important for you to read and ask the Holy Spirit what? To direct you because this is something, whether it's taught here or not, you're never going to run away from. It will catch up with you. Praise God. So we, at that point where um, um, partly uh, <clears throat> the power of God continues Mm. And then, from there on, I, I say this was between 1787 to 1810, again a deeper move comes. And I think the one I'm going to read about, although it's not very notable in history because it doesn't have many heroes behind it, becomes one of the most notable revivals in the history of the church, the one that I'm going to talk about. And I'll simply explain the events that lead to the layman's uh, revival. It's called the layman's revival. I want you to write the layman's revival from about 1857. That is the, the mid-1800s uh, going into the 1900s. Praise God. Now, what's the need of this move? One, the second great awakening has taken place. First great awakening has taken place. Second great awakening, uh, great awakening has taken place. Europe is growing. America is growing at the time when the gospel in Europe is going down. There is a lot of wars and cessations. I don't know that you remember in the 1800s, 17, 1800s, that's when we start to hear wars in France. Who remember Napoleon Bonaparte? Huh? Yeah, something like that. So you see Europe is breaking, and if you remember the exiling of the Pope and what, there's a lot of things negative happening in Europe. But time the move and the power, the glory, the strike and grain of the gospel is where? Is in America. So we've seen that move. But there were challenges too that happened in America that require the move, the move of the third move of what you call the layman, right? Remember this uh, first one of 1887 going into the whole 18s, it moved from seven, late 1700s into close to the mid-18s, right? The, the flames continued, right? But then something happens that brews up this layman's revival of 1857, which, I, again, as I read, and I'm going to show you, is one of the most interesting revivals I've ever read about, because it was never said much about why it didn't have names. It did not have many names. What happens? One... There was a problem in the revival of the Second Great Awakening. Now, in the time of Grandison Finney, 
which I believe was one of the greatest, because the second Great Awakening was three, there were three levels, right? And they happened in the different areas. For example, in the time when it goes to the Congregationalists, it happens differently. When it goes to the Southern Baptists, it happens differently. There were like three moves that lead to the Second Great Awakening. And I think one of the last moves was under Charles Grandison Finney, which was a lawyer. And uh, he was opposed to many things, and then he has an encounter by God, which propels him to start teaching and preaching the gospel. He becomes a Presbyterian minister, and then that there is a lot in the revival of Charles Grandison Finney that has an effect of one of the things that leads to the move of the layman. One, the frontier, what they call the frontiers uh, revival, which was by Grandison Finney in that same time. Um, there were many excesses, right? Every time flames hit church or ministry, revivals come and then they hit people, there will always be excesses. And like I said, what some people do is they throw away the baby and the bathtub and the towel and the sponge and the soap. Um, many of them don't keep the sanity and maturity and understanding. They say, you know what, there's a problem here, but can we deal away with the excesses and keep what is right? So it was. The power is moving. Genuinely, men are experiencing the true move. Stories are spoken that are undeniable. They say that one time, uh, Grandison Finney was seated in a train going through New York City, and the power of God hit the whole of New York. That was not evoked by a preaching. That was something that the church missed out. Because, you see, if you say that these are emotional, it means somebody has to propel them to emotion. And that's why many of the Calvinists, they say that Grandison Finney used to propel men into emotion. But what would you say when a man is seated in a train going through New York City without preaching anything and the power of God hits New York? You understand what I'm saying? What would you say on the events which are undeniable in the time of Grandison Finney that before he even stepped on the ground, the power had filled men? You understand? And it is spoken of in the days of Grandison that when he starts speaking, men just pass out. Now, the Calvinist says, overwhelmed by the conviction of sin. It's deeper than that. Praise God. Otherwise, if a man is saved and born again and does not carry the sin consciousness, that means that they do not, they cannot have that blessedness. But that's not so. It is something I realize many people in the Calvinist, most so in Europe and America, they don't have a very clear understanding of how this thing works. Because not many of them have experienced it a certain way. And you know, you should never throw out something because you have not had the experience of it. You should never disagree with something because it has not worked in your life. I ask men genuinely to ask God and tell him, you know what, God, talk to me about it. You'll be amazed. Because like I said, in Africa, for us, the way the scene came, many of us didn't know these doctrines and moves and revivals. We were in our rooms and, you know, we had visitations and encounters and we are out. You understand? But you read the word. The Bible says God comes to Abraham and tells him, I shall make you a great nation. I will multiply you exceedingly. And the Bible says, and Abraham fell on his face. Boom! You know? But you see, many people don't understand that was, that was a deeper experience that Moses narrated. Anyway, there are many things you will never be able to qualify, but heaven will, because when you have that blessed experience of the Holy Spirit on your life, and the results, because I remember for me the first time that thing comes on me, I was up on a mountain and I get in a vision and I said, there's somebody here with a skin disease. The first time that thing happened. And then there was a lady who put up her hand and she had a skin disease all through her body. And so I went to her and I said, in the name of Jesus, heal. It was the first time I had that thing. And her skin healed like that of a baby. But the first time I saw that, even me, I could not believe it. Do you understand? But then I start to realize that when I enter this grace and anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, the increase of the anointing is evident. I could see that the operation of the Holy Spirit went to another level. And I feel sorry because many people will never test that thing. Because they are so opposed to it, based on doctrine, dogma, Bible, school, and theology. You understand? So I'm not against theology. I'm only saying, again, is giving you the word. You seek the experience before God. That's what I'm trying to say. That's why we need that balance. We need that balance. God deal with you personally. What we can give is the word. What I teach every day is the word. But I'm not your experience. And I'm not your standard for the experience. No. 
the way God met the man of God and Romak is not the way he met me. It's not the way he met you. It's not the way he met him. But he deals with everybody. And everybody has their own special occasions. He told Peter, Tim, uh, Paul, for this reason I have appeared unto you, the Bible says, to make thee both a witness and a minister of the things I have shown you, or you have seen, and in the things in which I shall appear to you. In the, that's a deep word there. That means you don't limit God to the appearance of the Bible you're reading. He, he's deeper than the 40 writers. Are you hearing me? You don't set a standard that because with this one it was like that, therefore even with the other one it has to be so. No. No. Every generation is progressing. Every old womb gives a new birth and knowledge is increasing. We know more probably than the guys who lived in the 1700s or 1600s. And our children also will judge our work too and say, but dad, what were you thinking when you preached this? Praise God. If my children get to that level and they are right, thank God. Because that means the gospel is what? Yes, it's progressing. Praise God. So we see that one of the reasons why there was a need for another revival after about 50 or 60 years of this move is there were excesses in the frontier move of the Grandison Finneys. There was true infill of the Holy Spirit, power of the Holy Spirit, but there was also fanatics, people who took this to another level, right? If I'm in a meeting and then I see a man barking and he's moving, that's a demon. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can't make you bark. What's my part to do? I have to rebuke it because that's not the infill of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can't make you back. But I've seen it. You understand? Then someone goes and falls. You understand? But you must be stable enough to know that this is a dog spirit on a person. Some of, I don't know whether one of you is in a meeting one time and I addressed dog spirits. And people started barking. People started barking. About three people started barking. Because there was a dog. Some people have things on them. Yeah? Now, in those days, they would see someone barking and say, wow, the spirit is moving in a deeper way. <laughs> you get it? Yeah, the guy is dealing with something way bigger. And you know, whether we want it or not, present truth people, grace message people, we must understand how the spiritual world works. Because I also see that with the affirmation of truth that we have, we are free, we are delivered, we are what? Some of us assume that every man is there. Not every man has that knowledge. The Bible says, for some with the consciousness of the idol, up to today eat unto the idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So sometimes we assume that we are where every man is. No, every man ought to know this, but not every man knows that. And sometimes we have a problem with people who are possessed by demons, and then we insist and insist without helping them get from where they are to first getting them have this. You understand what I'm saying? And then some of them ail and die before they get to the knowledge. And sometimes it's only love to first rebuke the devil out while you allow the guy to get it. That's why we are grace ministers, but you see us delivering men from devils. There are some who are so staunch and they say, no, for us we don't cast out, we teach. And we teach, yes, but what if a man is ever learning but never coming to the knowledge? What do you do for the man, yes, who is seated in the meeting, but he has not yet gotten it? And then before you know that, another spirit has gotten on them. Should I continue teaching you? What if in the process, before you get it, you die? So for me, what I've decided is, while I'm teaching, I'll rebuke it. Right? When a man gets better and he's sober enough, let him stand and be better. But I also don't want to keep him in bondage. Because if I keep him in bondage, he becomes a what? A deliverance item. And that's where many pastors have kept our minister people. People have stayed there as bound and only depending on men of God to deliver them. No. Deliver them. Teach them. Teach them. Teach them. You understand? My problem is seeing someone who I rebuked the devil out of in 2016 and they still have a devil in 2020. That is my problem. You understand? But my problem is not rebuking devils in a meeting because you don't know who has come in that meeting and where they are. Maybe some of them are first-time visitors. They've never had this, but they've come with a dog spirit. And then it starts barking. In the frontier days, they say, oh, the spirit is moving in another way. So excesses came through, fanaticism came through, and then before we know that, some people lost interest in the move because... 
it, it, it became too much. And then that's why you start to hear some say God is the author, not the author of confusion. Because in the move of the Holy Spirit, some things started to appear like they were out of order. Again, I tell people, even when it's out of order, deal with the excesses. Don't kill the flame. Praise God. Don't kill the flame. That's why for me, I even call some aside. And I call them and I say, Sister, this one wasn't the Holy Ghost. This was something else. Can we pray about it? And some, when you pray, it manifests. <laughs> Praise God. So that was one of the reasons why. Two, slavery was increasing in the same period. Much as the move of the Spirit was there, this social evil was there. And there were tensions in the atmosphere because many slaves were getting more and more enraged again, either reform or revolve. And we feel that certain people are going to revolve, not only the slaves, but also people who were white during that time, but they felt it was unfair to enslave men. And so there was a need to eradicate slavery. And now, because of the excesses of the spirit, certain people also come out of that move that bring more challenges. One of which I think some of you have heard is a fellow they call Joseph Smith. Who was that of Joseph Smith? Joseph Smith is a fellow who was a direct recipient in the Grandison Finney days, but then he comes out with an excessive fanatic spirit. He starts to claim visions that the Lord has showed him. And then one day, this fellow one time comes with a vision and says an angel called Moroni took him a place and then made him in a vision he dug out uh, he dug a hole and then in there were certain tablets and people, the rest of the people around him could not read them but he had special glasses that could read them and then he starts to read the oracles that were given by God through the angel Moroni and then those are certain doctrines start to ensue through that and that is the birth of what you call present day Mormonism yeah. Joseph Smith <laughs> is the proponent of uh, Mormonism. The doctrine got so skewed until it, you, you would feel so stumbled to a place where if you go to present-day Mormons, the Latter-day Saints, they teach you can even marry as many women as you want. They have a very interesting understanding about the doctrine. If you read about it, that was one of the reasons. Certain people had started to come in through and they were preaching very strange things out of the Lord revealed to me. Again, when the move of the Spirit comes, you are going to start hearing many fake claims of what the Spirit said to certain individuals. That's why we need the Word, because the Word can check you out. Praise God. And then the, in that same time, there was a Baptist preacher from Tennessee. The guy was called William Miller. William Miller uh, read Daniel 9.25 and for some random reason something settles on this man and it convinces him that he could calculate up to the day of the coming back of Jesus. Indeed, William Miller did his math and calculated and he said the coming and end of time shall be in 1844. And he, because he was a very deep fellow on the other hand and also a recipient of the spirit, they could not doubt what was operating on his life. Many people believed him. He had a following. In fact, they were called the Millerites. And so they believed him and they say, you know what, this is our man. And then they gathered there uh, in Tennessee just to wait for the coming because they believed that Jesus Christ was going to appear in Tennessee. Sadly, he misfired. On that date, Jesus didn't appear. Then he says, oh no, I think I got it wrong. It was either the lunar or the Gregorian calendar. Now I'm using another calendar. The right calendar gives us another date. He set that date down. And then that end also did not come. He apologized uh, to the church and then he said he was sorry. And then uh, he has visions. God still speaks to him, but sometimes he receives the funny ones. Long and short, he becomes depressed. He dies a very sad death. But in that meeting of the Millerites, so the people that gather in Tennessee, is a young lady called Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White. Who knows Ellen G. White? <laughs> yes. So Ellen G. White uh, is the mother and founder of the Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, she had a vision that the Lord revealed to her. Also in the same way the Millers were claiming vision and the Joseph Smiths were claiming vision. She said Jesus Christ appeared to her openly and told her that the true holy saints, the people that are going to heaven and really being used of God, only pray on the Sabbath and they honor the Sabbath. You understand what I'm saying? 
And so the Sabbath, if you don't honor the Sabbath, you're not going to heaven, you're not a child of God, you're not used of God, you're a fake minister, everything in you is fake. And interestingly, they start following. And if you've read church history, from Ellen G. White, the Seventh-day Adventists have tried to prophesy the end of the time almost three times. And that is why now the Seventh-day Adventist church is split again into two. Because there's another group also that tried it twice, thrice, to prophesy the end of, of Jesus Christ and they have failed. That's why if you're around the Seventh-day Adventist circles, they are so fascinated about eschatology, the end times. Everything about it is the coming of Jesus Christ, when he will come, how he will come, the beast, the stone, the what, triple six, the, you understand? They are so fascinated with everything, the serpent, the what, Babylon, the mystery woman, the prostitute, the what, the seven heads, the seven nations, the what. Yeah. Eschatology is good to study, but if eschatology will make you, it will cause you not to plant a tree tomorrow. <laughs> or go to work then you have a problem that's why some bible schools are so quiet about it or if they do they touch what's important it's important but we need the balance of that otherwise some people get so fascinated in the end times and it's thousands of years jesus is not yet back now they no longer have a message you understand what i'm saying the exorcists during that same time also in uh, 1845 to 49, there was a wonderful, interesting president in the United States called James K. Polk. This fellow was a very smart, wise guy. He was a good um, economist, the way you see Trump. <laughs> Praise God. He dealt well with the nation and made many reforms that brought in financial uh, liberation to America. And then before we know that, prosperity was in the air. And uh, that's the time period where we see the birth of the Industrial Revolution. And then because of the industries that are coming through, we see urbanization. People coming from villages to come in the towns to work. And then because we know that we need more employees because the industries are coming through, what happens? Immigration. People come from Ireland and everywhere, Scotland, to come and get jobs. And so numbers are increasing also in there. And then America is regarded a very rich place. Everybody wants to go there to fulfill the American dream. And then because of a lot of speculation and many miscalculated moves and a lot of deceptions, you know, deception is interesting. It's like, for example, I'll take you back to the time when the British were colonizing Africa and the rest of the parts. They used to call it the United Kingdom. You understand? When they spoke about the United Kingdom, you thought it was bigger than America, all the same size. If you go on the world map right now and you look at the UK, United Kingdom, you see it's like six or seven times bigger than Uganda. But that was all fallacy. It was false. If you actually go in the real landmass, the United Kingdom is the same size as Uganda. But they deceived many and convinced many people of the might and grandeur of strength that they carried, the glamour and beauty and wealth that they carried, which they did not carry because that was the only way you could get in their heads of black men to convince them. Up to today, there's someone praying to go to the UK. But if you've been there, you will know those guys are broke. That's the truth. Everything is on credit. The car you have, you paid fully for it. They, everything is on credit, even their mobile phones, even their beds. <laughs> One time I went to watch a movie with somebody, and then they paid credit card, credit for a movie, $3. You understand in America? Anyway, so the, 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 the blessing of God doesn't need you in America. It will find you anywhere. If you should go to America or Europe or any other country, you go there for purpose. Hallelujah. But there is someone now dying to go to Hans' country. You see what I'm saying? Are you seeing what I'm saying? Are you following? So, the, the, because of much speculation and the miscalculations, there was the bottom started to bust. And what was big became a recession and the nation was hit in poverty. Boom. What were they to do with the urban workers who had come to work and more than 30,000 people have lost jobs? What were they to do with the immigrants who had come in and they did not have anything to eat? When men are desperate, they seek for God. Praise God. When men are desperate, they what? They seek for God. And that's exactly what happened. So, there was a collapse, and in history they call it the Panic of 1857. People were scared. And in that very year, 
December 1857, there were 200 Presbyterian ministers that gathered together in one room. Pastors called each other and said, you know what? Our fathers worked in the first and great awakening. What we need now is God because poverty is there. And where poverty is, is, sickness is. And where sickness is, many things are. War is. Crimes are. It's amazing how one thing leads to another. And men are all surrounded with desperacy. And there is no ray of hope. And so what do you need? You need the gospel. So 200 guys gather uh, in Pennsylvania to discuss the matters of the nation and pray. That was the beginning of what we call the layman's uh, revival. Now, what happened uh, in downtown Manhattan also, in that same time New York, there was a certain fellow who felt, you know what, I think the gospel needs to be evangelized again. What does he do? He gets a very young fellow called Jeremiah Lamphere, and then he tells him, you know what, uh, we want you to design a way of how we can reach other people because everything is falling and we need hope. So Jeremiah Lamphire goes on the streets to think of an idea to evangelize and he realizes every midday to one the streets were very busy because people had broken off for lunch hours. Then he gets the idea and he says, what if I get these men to pray? Because what we remember and what Jeremiah says he remembers was that during that time, Great Awakenings, every revival and Great Awakening is sparked by prayer. You know why? Because that's the biggest weakness of Christians. Christians don't pray. Even these ones who pretend they pray, they don't pray. Praise God. Christians cannot sustain prayer. Many Christians cannot sustain prayer. You cannot pray a certain way and your life does not change a certain way. If you're talking of their biggest attack in the body of Christ, it is prayer. The movie can be watched for two hours. The series can be watched for 24 hours. But the prayer to be sustained for 30 minutes, you're all looking at me with those faces, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Prayer was a bigger problem. So Jeremiah says, Lamphire says, you know what? I think if I get a bunch of, of course, the Presbyterian ministers had prayed, but then it ended there. It was not touched, but it ended there. But it is recorded in history that that December, Pennsylvania people got concerned and said, let us start seeking God for our nation. But this movement does not begin with pastors and ministers and the presbyteries. This begins with laymen. That's why they call it the layman revival. So this guy, Jeremiah Lamphire, gets, uh, prints uh, flyers, right? And then he starts distributing. He printed 20,000 of them in the street and called them to come to the church to, to pray uh, that day. <laughs> Guess what? When he calls them to pray that day, 20,000 flyers are given, leaflets are given out to invite men to prayer for the state of the nation. That day only six people turned up. And it's, it's amazing as this is. I remember when the Lord was telling me about the plight of our nation. I get a vision and the Lord tells me that um, this thing is going to begin through prayer. And I remember he said, I'm going to take you back to the universities. I never wanted to go to universities because they said, well, I don't like dealing with students then. I was a student myself. I wanted to enjoy the open world <laughs> and see the world and enjoy it too. And I thought I was going to go into the mainstream line of the gospel. And I remember in a vision, I see in a vision, I'm taken to universities and I see trees coming up and I see plants and they were giving very beautiful fruit. And, and then the voice tells me, if you go back to universities, I'll revive and bring life. Fruit will come out. So I say, God, what's the next step? And I'm invited by a group of uh, university students in Macquarie to pray with in Afrostone. And I summon them for a prayer meeting to come to pray. And guess what? <laughs> like Jeremiah Lamphere, they were six in the first meeting. <laughs> then I remember during that time, we sat down with Prosty and the rest of the group and agreed and said, every Monday we shall come here without fail for three hours to pray. We prayed for these universities for more, close to about two, three months. And like Jeremiah Lamphere, the same results came through. Because with Jeremiah, the first weekend, six people come. The next weekend, 12. Next, 20 the next 40. You understand what I'm saying? But he still insists, let us believe God. And in a space of three, four, five months, you had 3,000 people gathering for prayer. Praise God. And I see also in our side of the ministry, as we continued praying and praying, I remember in Afroston, we just used to pray and people would pass and the power hits them and then they bring them to join the fold. Some of them were not invited. The power used to arrest them. I remember this guy who had gone to see his girlfriend. I never forget that guy. 
the power of God hits him so bad. They carry him, and then the next thing we know, what were you doing? I'd come to see my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> he was shaking <laughs> under the power of the Holy Spirit. So anyway, the 20 become 40 from the 10,000 what? Leaf pamphlets he has squared. And then before that, there are 3,000. This move spreads to Manhattan. And when it goes from Manhattan, they sell it to Philadelphia. Guys are meeting in lunch hour to pray. It goes to the thousands. It goes to Chicago. It goes to the thousands. It hits Illinois and everywhere. Before you know that, the whole nation was praying in lunch hour. That's where you hear what they call the lunch hour prayer. Not our guys who do lunch hour because they need to pay off the buildings. And so to sustain the rent, you need to put lunch hours and strange conferences such that you can sustain the building and pay off and have a, meet, a meeting. No offense, but some people are not doing lunch hours of the spirit. Some are doing lunch hours not because of the urgency of conviction. Some are doing lunch hours such that they can pay off the rent. Praise God. Those things, I, I'm, I can only say them. Praise God. Now, that's where the lunch hour thing comes through. Before you know that the whole nation was praying and there were no pastors to give glory to. Men started meeting in small meetings and they had this one rule. If you lay man revival, when you come in the meeting, one, you're not supposed to preach. We're not interested. We got tired. Extremes have frustrated us. People are over talking. We are over talking and the church does not have results. People are sick and beggarly and there are no results. So when you come here, you don't talk. If it's exhortation, speak for like two, three minutes, four, five as a leader to exhort us in a direction, but we don't want you to open to us your revelation concerning Paul and Timothy. We are tired. We have had it all. We've had the Lutherans, the Calvinists, the Methodists, the Armenians. We've had it all. We know it. Now what we want is the real power of God. You understand? There was no place of you coming with special revelation. They were not interested of missing mysteries. What they needed was men to get together and pray. So you come in that meeting, there are people who have prayer requests and they say, oh, there's a sister so and so. She has a husband battling with cancer. Let's pray. So they share each other's prayers. They start praying for their young children who had gone wayward. Because during that time, many, many of the youth were wasted and gone. And so they start gunning down. And that move actually did not only stay in America. It hit through Europe. In the years to come, even in the early 90s, certain people kept that same mind because of what the, the results this Lehman revival gave. And shared with me that in his earlier years of ministry and life, they used to have that sort of thing in Holland. They just used to meet and pray. Those days have to come back. Yes, let's share the word and everything, but there are moments we just need to come and pray. Uninterrupted. We are going to do that in the name of Jesus. Yes, don't just come to here. No, once in a while create moments of simple prayer, uninterrupted. There is something that happens when men pray. Praise God. And if you want to know what the layman movement did, and, and the results of men praying together, I will read some of you, some of them for you. We started seeing mass conversions. Mass conversions. In fact, there is a general, war general, uh, called Stonewall Jackson, who invited some of these guys to come and share the spirit and mind of prayer and the person of Christ. And more than 150,000 soldiers were one in a space of a few months. As in, you started to see people coming to church through the life of prayer. Churches doubled and multiplied. The layman's revival in a small period grew up to a, hand, a million converts. That was bigger than what even the first great awakening could do. More than a million converts, men were praying. You pray during lunch hour, it convicts you to go to church. During lunch hour in Manhattan, New York City, 80% of the shops are closed. Men are praying. Even customers know if you come to buy something and, and it's time for prayer, go with the guy you're going to buy things from at least and have a prayer for one hour. It was adhered to. There was no extension in two, three, four, five minutes of 20, but the Spirit is leading nothing. If it's that time of prayer, it's midday to one. You go back working. And then because of that, the whole entire nation, the biggest part of the praying group was a fasting group. And when men are fasting and praying, the Spirit, spirit starts speaking. 
You understand? There was never prayer like in that time before. Somebody shout hallelujah. But he did not have a leader. <laughs> he didn't have a special man of God with a revelation. These were laymen in their farms and factories, businessmen. You understand? Who were gathering their own factory workers. It was a must for them to pray. So if you're a business leader here, you must put an altar to your business. They must pray by fire, by force. <laughs> Praise God. That was where we got the birth of what you presently call Sunday school. They had to provide a place for children also to start knowing God early. Praise God. College missions were burst through the Lehman Revival. YMCA, YWCA, the place of reaching men by the gospel through sports. That was the idea. The birth and certain men which are recipients of that praying movement are the men which go even up to England, United Kingdom, people like uh, William Booth, the guy of the Salvation Army. These guys come through the Lehman Revival. Men like D.L. Moody, mm. salvation through faith and the love of God. These guys received it by the Lehman's Revival movement. And a man who had not gone to school like D.L. Moody, he has the effect on the world like nobody has ever imagined. With his business acme, that man changed the world. And for the first time, besides the scaring, <laughs> the scaring, uh, preachings of, of, of the Grandison Finneys, hmm? the, the doctrinal debates of the Wesleyans. D.L. Moody is among the first people we see whose message is centered only on the love of God. If you go back in history, if you read the Grandison Finneys, ah, Grandison would, he, by the time he has been pre preaching, he is the worst sinner in the world. <laughs> Finney. But the conversions were there. They would say the man would pray for three, four, five hours, come on the pulpit. In ten seconds, ten minutes, miracles are happening. He says, who wants to get born again? He doesn't even need to teach. The glory is enough to win men's souls. But also, the mode of teaching was very rudimentary. It was rough. You understand? And some of the revivals earlier were simply preaching the doctrine, which was okay. But no man in history, do we know, has stressed the love of God in his revelation like the teachings of D.L. Moody. You understand what I'm saying? And these men are the men that change what? Yes. They bring men to repentance. Because that's what the love of God does. And so we start to see the move of God. We start to see multiplications. They tell you in history, church never grew in history. Like the Pentecostal church in America never grew in history. Like in the Lehman's revival. Praise God like in the Meleman's revival. Now, <sighs> as though that's not enough again, freedom comes back to the nation. The liberties of the spirit are there. The glory of the church comes through. And before we know that, a very dis disturbing evil comes through. It was called liberalism. In the late 1800s, liberalism is like a bit the edge of reason, except that liberalism now is in the church. It is not like the Voltaire's against the gospel. No, another problem comes through in the 1800s, all through to the 1900s, and I believe it's still existent up to today. We are still dealing with that devil called liberalism. Now, what does liberalism do? Liberalism makes an attempt to... To deal with the gospel from human thought, from human culture, from human reason, theology becomes liberal. You understand? It, it, it gets to a point where, no, 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 you don't, you don't only think, but you go to a place of connecting what you think with the word and whatever does not relate with the thinkable things in the word you deal away with. And sadly, because of that, we have a problem where now the liberal faith people, theological uh, liberalism, starts to challenge the fundamental, most distinctive fundamental ideas of the gospel. They debated the Trinity. They debated the deity of Christ. They debated salvation by faith alone. They debated the resurrection of Christ. Do you know there are guys in America right now who 
don't believe that Jesus is the only way. No, no, no. Christians, they are present truth ministers. There is one I think they even asked openly, do you believe Jesus is the way? He refused. If you've watched YouTube, you've seen him. He refused. He said, no, I believe there are other ways. That's liberal Christianity. It cannot call a sped a sped. And because of that, um, it opens men to thinking. Right? They call it higher criticism, where they look at the word and compare it with philosophy to say, but is this reasonable? You guys, we have to be really serious. We, we shouldn't just take everything as it is because we don't even know who was writing it and who compiled it and what they intended. So liberal faith sometimes in the mind of higher criticism sometimes goes deeper into saying, but let us also understand science. Let us also understand philosophy. Right? Now I think you're seeing in present day, the biggest picture to give you the debate is uh, when you hear men debating about homosexuality. Hmm? Can you talk about it in America? You can't. Because the liberals also have their place to say no. But you see, science says this. But you see, philosophy teaches this. But you see, history teaches that. And now they've put the church in a very, very interesting position. Why? Because when the church does not agree with it, now they are um, accusing the church for hating them. No. We might not agree with the sin. We don't hate this person. No. Oh, and also true, some, many, some believers are like that. They've also started becoming so legalistic and losing the mind of Christ that when they see somebody and they say that person is gay, they never want to talk to them. They have nothing to do with them. Oh, so you love who? No, I know bad company corrupts, but this one you just go to know. What of those ones who are and you don't know them? Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you judging a man because of what you have seen? That's why our girls in church are aborting. Because when they keep the babies, they'll become worse sinners than the one who aborted. You understand what I'm saying? And that's a problem in the body of Christ. So yes, the Bible is clear on things like homosexuality. The Bible is against homosexuality. Right? But because it is, that doesn't mean that they're your enemies. They're not our enemies. We will win them through the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? But then now they've created the trick to say that because the Christian does not agree with that, therefore we hate them. We are anti. Right? But again, there's liberals who are saying, no, but science is telling us that some people are born that way. Or some people are oriented that way. It's beyond them. So why should you pray for them when they were created that way? That is why now you see in Europe the debates of should we allow gay marriages or not? And some churches are joining people in holy matrimony. And right now, someone can stone me if I said it there. But all of us were born with very innocent mind. In fact, I believe even the people struggling with it, it shocked them the first time. The first time I saw a man kissing, it hit me. I was like, oh, God, what are these guys doing? You understand what I'm saying? But then the Lord has taught me, when you understand grace, you learn to deal with them in love. You don't? Yes, you learn to deal with them in love. You be patient with them as the Lord deals with them. You understand what I'm saying? But again, you don't say, I support it. That's another thing. Although for them, when we love them, but don't support it, they say, we hate them. Right? And that's not it. That's not it. But these are fundamental things, because what is in Europe is coming. And we better prepare ourselves. And we are not going to fight like men of the flesh. And also put ourselves there in opinions of, I believe this, I don't believe that. No. Give men Christ. He will sort them. Stay true. I sought to know nothing and be acquainted of nothing, save Christ and him one. Crucified. That's, that's important. Praise God. So they reduced Christianity to the basics of Christianity. Jesus becomes historical. He's not experiential. Some of the things you're saying then are not for now. Some of the miracles are for those days, they are not now. These things were written just for historical, but not experiential. Yes, God exists, 
but what we need in this society is not another miracle. We don't believe in the demonstrations. All we need is love and good ethics. Can we have good ethics and love? Can we have hope for the future? If we can have hope and love and good ethics. No, not in one piece. We are just talking about what Christianity has zeroed on to. So it's simply preaching about love, ethics, and hope. Those are important. But talk about the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Talk about the delivering power of the Lord. Talk about the experience of God. To know Him. Eternal life. Praise God. So the certain parts were dealt with. And, and, and sadly, up to present day, we're still dealing with that because now these things are taught in what? Theology school. I have a young man who called me in one of the most successful uh, um, schools in, in, in England. And um, they told him in the Bible school, they told him demons don't exist. He called me. Apostle, he said demons don't exist. I told him, what are you doing there? It's your choice. Praise God. You don't believe in devils. I told him, tell your, your professor to come to Africa. Or to invite me there. <laughs> or to invite, to do these things. Either he comes or give me an invitation there to prove that demons exist. Those ones just go in class and say, Holy Ghost. Poo -poo -poo -poo. Then you tell him, no comment. You walk out and get your first flight back home. <laughs> Praise God. But you see, when liberal Christian theology comes through, it empowers what? philosophies and that's the idea again the increased line the thing of rationalism the proving of god by reason of the 60s it came back in that dispensation empiricism which says you know what your mind cannot reason out god you need empirical evidence to prove the things that you're saying if it cannot be proved then it is not god and many of the things you're speaking up as proof because we are not there then you have the David Humes who bring the idea of skepticism. There are no absolute truths. There are relative truths. I think later the Hegels get it and take it to another level and they say truth is relative and evolving. It's not absolute. Your definition of truth is different from my definition of truth and we are all right in a certain way. You define secularism one way, I define it another way, respect. And then we have guys like the Kants who uh, bring agnosticism. And uh, they, they say what you see in the physical realm is what's real. What you don't see in the physical is not there. You understand? So before we know that, it starts to brew up again. Because when it comes extreme again, what? Either reform or revolve. Every time men go to a certain place of losing way, the fire now starts to come and wants to hold them what? Uh, at ransom and accountabans. That's where now we start to have the growth of the evangelicals uh, trying to say, you know what, I think we need to respond to this madness. That was the beginning of men doing what you call Bible conferences, to say, you know what, these guys are deluding men, they are making us skeptical, they are going into our minds to say, you know, your mind is matter. What it interprets is not enough for it to say that it's absolute truth because your mind is not even yet sure that what you call us is really us. That's its opinion about it. If it did not exist in this earth, maybe it would not even be the mind. Or maybe the earth is because your mind believes that it is, but maybe it's not really it. Are you sure that what you see is what really it is? And there are people who see blue and the other ones see pink and it's the same eyes that were given to them. Are you sure that what you're reading is what is so? Are you sure that your human mind is strong enough to comprehend the unseen realities of God. Yes, he created you, but are you wise enough to fit that into your head? Be liberal. Relate with what your mind can relate with. And some even question your mind and say, but how, how, how true? How? Because maybe lions see this world differently. Maybe elephants see this world differently. What if the way you see the world is wrong and the way giraffes see it is the right one? That's why we say truth is what? Relative. Your definition of truth might not be my definition of truth. Can we respect our own different definitions of truth? Yes. And then these evangelicals say another madness has come through. Like the thing that starts the first great awakening, you remember? And the second great awakening after the age of reason and enlightenment is the same thing that comes through. And this guy says, uh-uh. So they start putting what they call Bible conferences. They just put conferences to teach the Bible. 
Praise God. Amen. To teach the word. Men like C.H. Spurgeon. Huh? They were debaters of this thing. They were very deep guys. The, 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 the Billy Sanders. All they want is get me a word. They started to do conferences. Right? And camp meetings to prove the Holy Ghost. That the person of the Holy Spirit exists. And these things you're talking about don't really uh, make sense. They started to build institutions and Bible schools were deliberate. Why? Because some Bible schools had taken the direction of what? Liberal thought. So when they see that this Bible school has taken direction of liberal thought, they break out of it and start another one and keep the original thing. You understand what I'm saying? Um, but this did not stop the liberals, unfortunately. The splits were there, but the liberal faith continued. The liberal theologies continue. And uh, why? Because for them, what they did, like revivals beginning in Princeton, Yale, the Great Awakening, Harvard, Cambridge, the liberal faith also begin their move by going to universities. Before you know that, the Princetons have swallowed it, the Yale's have swallowed it, the Oxford have swallowed it, because every move begins with the youth. Once you can convince the youth something. Now, these old men are trying to do Bible colleges and institutions, which are good, conferences are wonderful, but on the institutional level, the liberal faith fellow has taken over. That's why today, many liberal people who ascribe to theology call liberalism. Many of them don't believe in things like divine healing. They don't believe in things like prophecy. They don't believe in things like demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit because those are not reasonable. Praise God.